read for Joshua chapters um, 14 and 15. Let's see where we have been, where we're going. The uh, a review of the chapters is chapter 1 has to do with Joshua prepares for the conquest. Hopefully what this accomplishes, we mentioned this uh, several times, but reviewing the chapters just refreshes that in our mind of what we've covered. And what I'm hoping is that by the time we finish the book, that at least the earlier chapters have gone over them several times that those begin to uh, sink down in our minds so that when later someone mentions Joshua 1, you said, oh, that's preparing for the conquest. Chapter 2, the spies go into Jericho. Chapter 3 is the crossing of the Jordan. And chapter 4 has to do with the memorial stones in two places. Chapter 5, the second generation was circumcised. Chapter 6 was beginning of the conquest, the taking of Jericho. And then chapter 7 had to do with the defeat at Ai. Achan's sin was the reason for that. And then there was the victory at Ai as they corrected the problem. There was the treaty uh, with the Gibeonites, chapter 9. Chapter 10 was the southern campaign, conquest of the south. Chapter 11 was the northern campaign, conquest of the north. And then to chapter 12, there is the last week we talked about the kings that were conquered by Moses and Joshua. Uh, the list of those, and then chapter 13 dealt with the division of the land on the east. Now, we're ready for chapter 14. This is our outline, um, and we are in the last section of claiming their inheritance uh, as we've d crossed the river, conquered the enemy, and now we're talking about claiming the inheritance. And so what we have are three, uh, four major sections, the tribal territory being assigned to the tribes, what we're talking about on the eastern side, and then we have the western side, and so we're going to go from one of those two sections to the other in chapters 14, then moving into chapter 15. Uh, then we'll talk about special cities appointed, like the cities of refuge, and we'll talk all about that a little bit later. All right, this is a map of the, where the 12 tribes settled, and what we've seen so far after they conquered the land with that central campaign, then the southern campaign, then the northern campaign, is that Moses had already assigned that this was to be settled by the tribe, uh, two and a half tribes, that is Reuben, Gad, and a half a tribe of Manasseh. So what we're going to be doing in our lesson tonight is talking about the, the land on the west side of the River of Jordan, and that is the nine and a half tribes that are going to be settled, and we'll get into that here in just a second. So chapter 14, what's it about? <clears throat> Call it simply the division of the land, the land and uh, Caleb. Hebron. And so here's uh, two things that happen in this chapter. The, the land is to be divided to nine and a half tribes. Graded ages, you have a question about how many tribes. There's your answer, nine and a half tribes uh, uh, in verses one to five. Now we'll come back to that outline here in just a moment. Uh, and we've already mapped out the, the, the uh, land on that side. Uh, those nine and a half tribes because we had two and a half tribes on the other side. So let's talk about verses 1 to 5. Uh, verses 1 to 5, these are the areas the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan. And there's a couple of things I'm going to learn from verses 1 and 2. First is how the land was divided. We talked about this last time. If you were not here, this would be a good time to make a marginal note of how that was accomplished. And uh, if you made notes from last week, you probably have something in chapter uh, 12 or 13 about this, and that is it was done by Lot, and we'll get to that at verse 2. But I want you to notice that Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the tribes, that is uh, there was a man from each tribe that were involved in distributing the land as an inheritance. Well, one of the things I learned from verse 1 is something about national unity. There doesn't seem to be any partiality, there doesn't seem to be any jealousy, there doesn't seem to be any war and fighting. Uh, among the children of Israel. Now, they've had to go in and fight for the land, but once they get the land, there doesn't seem to be any jealousy of why is Judah getting this large section and Benjamin's only getting this small section? Uh, we ought to have part of your section. And uh, so some infighting, none of that. There seems to be national unity here. Of They conquered the land, and now God is making the choice, but he's doing that through the priest and Joshua and a man from each tribe. And they are assigning this to each tribe, and of course that's done by Lot. Now we see that at verse 2, that the inheritance was by Lot as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and a half a tribe. So again, we have the number of tribes that are involved. Now let's go back and talk about this, uh, numbering this by, by Lot. How was that done? 
Uh, we cited two passages last time. I'm going to add a third one to that. Uh, if you don't, uh, if you still have your notes from last week or don't have, uh, you might add these passages. Uh, here's how, how the division was determined, and it was determined by lot. We've got Numbers 33:54. We're not going to turn there again. That was a passage from last week. Numbers 34, 13 to 29. That's another one of the ones we looked at last week. Let's add a num another one, Numbers 26, 55. There's another passage that you might add here that this was done by Lot, some, some uh, random chance kind of thing. Uh, there's a great deal of discussion among students uh, of the various ways, the rolling of the knuckle bone of, uh, of an animal uh, or the drawing of something like straws. But as Proverbs 16.33 shows that when Lot was done, where God was involved, um, or where the people of God was involved, God did the choosing. So it was a matter of choosing it by Lot, but God divinely intervenes so that he determines that Judah's going to get this and Benjamin gets this and Manasseh gets this section here. So God was doing the choosing, though he does that by Lot according to verse 2. Uh, again, exactly what form of Lot uh, we're, we're not told, but you might do a study in ISBE or some one of those sources about the various forms of casting lots. Now, but uh, I'm not worried about that because, again, Proverbs tells me God in, intervened in that, and so God's doing the choosing. And I take it from verse, um, verse, taking verses 1 and 2 together, the people of Israel knew and understood God was doing this through Joshua and the high priest and the, the man from each tribe so that they don't rebel against that. In other words, they're not rebelling against uh, Joshua. Why did you do give this part of the land? We should have had that better part of the land. Or uh, they, they shouldn't have got as much as what they got. Again, national unity in verses 1 and 2. Now let's finish verses 3, uh, three 4, and 5 because all this is talking about is the land that is to be divided. Details of that's to be given later as we're going to see even in chapter 15 that for Moses had given the inheritance to two tribes and a half a tribe on the other side, talking about Reuben, Gad, and a half a tribe of Manasseh on the east side. Moses had taken care of that, but he gave no part to the Levites. In other words, they weren't given uh, a portion of the land, but they were to dwell among all the tribes and given cities that we'll talk about in studies that are yet to come. And then in verse 5, as, Moses, as the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. So, all we're learning in verses 1 to 5 is how it was done and the land that was to be divided, those nine and a half tribes. Now let's talk about Caleb inheriting Hebron. Now we learn a great deal here uh, about character, and we'll talk more about that as we go along. But hey, uh, Caleb is going to inherit Hebron. Now let's take a moment to look at the outline because I'm going to leave that and we're going to go to a mount and stay there for a little bit. And so if you're making notes in the margin, you're copying this, you might want to copy these two points down real quick. That uh, Caleb inherits Hebron, verses 6 to 15. And Caleb gives an explanation and a request in verses 6 to 12, and then 13 to 15, Caleb is given Hebron. So let's find Hebron now on the map, and uh, this is the tribe of Judah. This is from Lagos, where a little better map than some of the others we've been using. But you see Hebron in the, uh, the rectangle box there is Hebron. Now this is the tribe of Judah, and we'll talk about the borders and the boundaries in chapter 15, but this is in the hill country. And so if you'll notice here, uh, if you can look at the... Uh, a uh, little bit at the map, that this is in the hill country, and there's something to be said about that, where this is the lowlands, we'll talk about a little bit later, and then the wilderness over here, but right in the middle from Jerusalem on down is uh, the, the mountainous region. Now there's a point to be made about that as we're going to see in chapter 14, but let's start at verse 6. That the children of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, that's been home base for them for the last little bit, and Caleb, the text says, came to him and said, you know, uh, the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God concerning you and me at Kadesh Barnea. Uh, that is, here's what the Lord said about us uh, back uh, when we went and spied out the land is what he's talking about 40 years, uh, 45 years before. Uh, back when we were 40 years, well, I was 40 years old, he's saying. So you remember what the Lord said back then. He said, I was 40 years old when the servant of the Lord sent me to Kadesh Barney to spy, uh, from Kadesh Barney to spy out the land, and I brought back word uh, to him as it was in my heart. Now that's an interesting phrase. We'll come back to that phrase a little bit later toward the end of our study. 
But I brought back the report. Well, you remember the story is that Joshua and Caleb uh, brought back uh, the report, a positive report that we are well able to take the land. But all the other spies said we can't do it and they're giants there and, and they were pessimistic. And we're going to see more about that in verse 8. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up made the heart of the people melt. Now you stop and think about that. What their, what their report was, their report was we can't do that. They're giants in the land. Uh, they're bigger and mightier than we are. We can't uh, t take the land. And so they were all pessimistic. Now it doesn't word it that way here that they were pessimistic, but it shows the effect of their pessimism and their negativism and their lack of faith. Because it words it this way, they made the heart of the people melt. In other words, when God tells us to do something and someone says we can't do that and they're pessimistic, they show a lack of confidence, it has an effect upon other people and it makes the heart of the people melt. Your footnote may give a different rendering of that. The courage of the people failed. Courage to fail. That's what it means their heart melted. So people, instead of having the courage, we can do this, we're going to go, we're going to conquer, we're well able to do that, the courage failed. They lack courage now. Uh, so your pessimism, your negative, is, uh, negative spirit, if you have one, can very well cause the courage of other people to fail. Rather than having the confidence, I can do what God wants me to do, I can fulfill the commands of God, maybe we can, and so our courage fails. Practical thing. Uh, strengthening the hand of the sinner uh, rather than strengthening the hand of the people of God. But now notice what he says, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. There's a couple of things about that we want to talk about. Caleb says, I wholly followed the Lord my God. Now let's get ahead of ourselves and notice again at verse 9, You might, if you're underlining that phrase, you find it again because you have, this is what Moses said to him, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Then drop down to verse 14 at the end, because he, he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Three times in this text, he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Now let's try some other references where that's found. Then we're going to come back to the context. Let's go back over to Numbers 14, uh, the occasion where this took place. The spies were sent out in chapter 13. They brought the, the, uh, the report back, the negative report, and then the positive report. And I want you to notice at Numbers 14 and verse 24, but my servant Caleb, because he had a different spirit in him, contrasted to what the others had, and has, full, has followed me fully. Very similar wording. He followed me fully, the others had a pessimistic spirit. Let's go to another reference. Deuteronomy chapter 1. If we don't accomplish anything tonight, but notice that phrase and what it means, uh, that'll be some practical encouragement to us. Uh, number, uh, Deuteronomy 1, beginning at verse 34, the Lord heard the sound of your words and was angry and took an oath saying, Surely not a one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land except Caleb and uh, he shall see it, and I am giving the land to him as he walked, because he wholly followed the Lord. Same phrase. Let's go to one more reference. Numbers 32. Numbers 32. And let me get my reference. Verses 11 and 12. Numbers 32, 11 and 12. Surely none of the men who came up from Egypt as same point being made, are able to go because they have not wholly followed me except Caleb. And then verse 12 says, he wholly followed the Lord. So a number of times the text talks about him wholly following the Lord. Now let's just pause and forget about the context and we're going to come back to the context. Uh, a good practical question to ask is, are you wholly following the Lord in contrast to partially following the Lord? Do you partially follow the Lord? In other words, are you following the Lord and, and doing most of what the Lord wants you to do, but there's some things the Lord wants you to do you're not doing, so you could not be said you're wholly following the Lord. Are you fully and wholly following the Lord? There's another thing to, to ask at verse, uh, in our text at verse 8. 
And, and that is, or another point to make, that is not arrogant. In fact, we're going to see his humility, Caleb's humility at verse 12 in a moment. It is not arrogant to say, I'm wholly following the Lord. This is Caleb saying this about himself. The Lord had said that about him. And Caleb is repeating that now, saying, I'm wholly following the Lord. That's not arrogant. That's just a statement of fact that I, I in contrast to others, have wholly followed the Lord. But let's go back and put that in the context. The context deals with the contrast at verse 8. The heart, the, the, the discouragement of the pessimism. Here were those who were pessimistic. But, he said, I wholly followed the Lord. That was a contrast back in Deuteronomy 1. That was a contrast back in Numbers 14. And so it's not just wholly following the Lord in contrast to partially following the Lord. That's, that's there. That contrast is there. But it's a contrast of either wholly following the Lord or a pessimistic spirit. So if we have this pessimistic spirit about what the Lord wants me to do, but I, can't think I, I don't think I can fully do that, I don't think I'm capable of doing that. I don't think we can do what the Lord wants us to do fully. Then we're not wholly following the Lord. Practical stuff there, hopefully, uh, we, we gain something from that. Now let's continue that uh, through, verse, um, through verse 12. This is Josh, uh, Caleb's explanation. He said, I wholly follow the Lord. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land uh, of your foot that has trodden shall be your inheritance, you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Now, verse four, uh, 10, jo uh, Caleb says, the Lord has kept me alive all this time. He said, I was 40 years old when that took place and when we went off and um, uh, made, were spies. But it's been 45 years since. Now, let's stop and do a little math. We did this earlier and came up with some numbers. And if you were not a part of that, then this would be a good place to make a marginal note. It's been 45 years since Kadesh Barnea. That's when they sent the spies into the land at this point. Joshua says, graded ages, here's one of your questions. Joshua, uh, not Joshua, but Caleb is 85 years old at this time. He's 85 years old, verse 10. It's been 45 years since. He was 40 years old at uh, Kadesh Barnea. It's been 45 years since. They spent 38 years wandering in the wilderness. You say, I thought it was 40, but they'd already spent two years by the time Kadesh Barnea came along. So you, you take the 45 and you subtract the 38 from that, and that tells us how many years it took to do the conquest. That is, that central campaign, the southern campaign, and the northern campaign, how long did all that take? Approximately seven years. Some say seven and a half. I'm not worried about that, whether it's seven or seven and a half, because some say it was 37 and a half instead of 38, uh, because it had been two and a half years. Okay, I'm not, just for round numbers, it had been 38 years, 45, take the 38 from 45, about seven years, so seven years to make the conquest. And we've already given that, that date or that number earlier, but how did we get there? This is the verse that gave us that, that clue. Uh, if you were not here that night, then, then that's a, a good place to make a marginal note to remind us of that. Now look at this at verse 11. He said, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. He's 40, this is 45 years later. He's 85 years old, but I'm as strong now as I was then. So now is my strength for war, both for coming in and going out. What's his point? Not bragging on himself. What he's saying is, if I can go in and take a section of the land and conquer and drive out the enemy, so can everybody else. Does that make sense? I'm 85 years old. It's been 45 years since. Joshua, or Caleb, is a man of confidence, a man that's with a positive spirit, and what he seems to be trying to say, not only to Joshua, but all the rest, if I can go in and I can conquer and I can take a city and I can drive out the giants and I can do that, so can everybody else. The point seems to be very similar of Hebrews 12. If I can, everybody else can too. So now notice what he chooses. Verse 12, now therefore give me the mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakim, that's giants. That's what he's talking about. The Anakim are giants. Give me the mountains where the giants are and that the cities were great and fortified. Now, we'll, we'll finish the verse in a moment, but he says, here's, here's what I want. Uh, exactly what Moses had said about the inheritance Caleb would give is not recorded in, in the Pentateuch that I know of. But... He said, Moses had said I would get, the, get uh, a portion of the land, and I'm ready to take my portion. Here's where I want. 
I want to take the mountains where the giants are and where the fortified cities. He could not have picked a harder battle. He could not have picked a harder battle. The mountains where the giants are and in fortified cities, I'm 85 years old. I want the difficult. I'm ready to tackle it. I'm ready to go. Now, what courage that is. Now, let's get, look at the end of verse 12. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. Now, that seems a little strange now because Joshua, or I keep wanting to call him Joshua, Caleb is this man who is so positive and, and uh, so optimistic, and yet he says here, it may be that the Lord will be with me. I don't think that's a statement of question or of doubt that I'm going to take this and I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe we can drive the Lord. I don't, think that, I don't think that's what he's saying. I don't think it's a question. I think he is being positive, but it is an humble dependence upon God. I don't think he's saying, look, I'm strong. He'd said I'm strong at verse, verse 11, but I don't think he's relying. I'm, oh, I'm strong. I'm as, I'm as strong and as mighty as I was when I was 40 years old, and I can go in and I can conquer that mountainous region. I can drive those giants out. I'm as good as anybody. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's saying I'm strong because I depend on the Lord, and he's wholly dependent upon the Lord. It may be that the Lord will allow me to drive them out. Something practical there for us. Now let us get 13, 14, and 15. Um, so let's go back to our outline. We know where Hebron is. Uh, Caleb gave his explanation and his request. Here's why I want this land, and here's the request I make. So 13 to 15, Joshua gave Hebron to him. So Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb. And uh, Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb. And then here again we have that phrase, who wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And tells us its previous name. Um, and there was the greatest, uh, it was named after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakin. And in order to, it was named after one of the giants, but now the, is known as Hebron. Then the land had rest from war. So he got that, uh, that territory. That's not all he's going to get. We're going to see more about that in a moment. So that's chapter 14. The land that's to be divided on the west side, and then Caleb gets Hebron. And what confidence, and uh, there's, there's lessons upon lessons in ver chapter 14 about Caleb and his confidence. All right, let's uh, catch up on questions here, and um, then we'll go to chapter 15 here in just a second. Um, for the adults, question number three, what tribe was not given an inheritance? That would be the tribe of Levi. What did Caleb say about himself? He said he wholly followed the Lord. And what does verse 10 say about how long the conquest took? Seven years. And what portion did Caleb receive? He received Hebron. That catches us up for the adults. Graded ages, let's see if we've got you caught up. Uh, starting with question four or five and working backwards. Uh, question five, what did Caleb say about how he followed the Lord? He wholly followed the Lord. How many years? Question four, seven. How old was Caleb when he divided the land? He should have had 85. Question two should be nine and a half. And question number one was they did it by lot. All right. Let's go to 15 now. Three things happened in 15. 15 has to do with this division of the land on the west. It talks about the, the land that's given to Judah. So we're, it's not going to take us forever to get through chapter 15. We may even finish a little early tonight because uh, we're not going to take the time to trace every city here. I don't think that's necessary. But we'll talk about why those cities are mentioned here in just a second. Uh, here's the land given to Judah, verses 1 to 12. Caleb occupies Hebron and Debir, 13 to 19. And then here's the cities of Judah in uh, verses 20 to 63. Let's talk about the land that's given to Judah. Now, we're going to talk about the, uh, the border and map that out. So just take a moment to look at the outline first. Uh, um, if you're making marginal notes in your Bible, as I have, you might mark off verses 1 to 4 being the southern border. It tells us what, what's, uh, what constituted the southern border for the tribe of Judah. Verse 5, the eastern border, pretty simple. 5b to 11, the northern border. And then verse 12 is the western border. And so uh, let's, uh, that's not what I want. Let me go to another map here. And let's uh, map out 
um, Judah. Let's go back right here. This map we had earlier. Uh, this shaded area right uh, here, starting along all of this region, following all of that, that area through there, is the tribe of Judah. So let's talk about the, the southern border first of all. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to read every word of these verses. I'm going to point out some key things as we go along. Verses 1 to 4 talks about the southern border. And notice that the southern border starts at the shore of the Salt Sea from the bay that faces southward. In other words, this, this, this bay right here. So from the very basically tip point of the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea, is that's where it starts. So where does it go? Well, he, he gives a number of cities. But notice he mentions... Um, uh, that it comes through Kadesh Barnea, by, uh, uh, on the south side of Kadesh Barnea. And, and then finally, verse 4 makes its way all the way over to the, uh, the, the, uh, the sea. So in other words, it starts here uh, and makes its way all the way past southern border of Kadesh Barnea and then all the way over to the, to the Mediterranean Sea, and that's the southern border. So it's a long border. Now, uh, the Grady Dages have got a question about this. Uh, so let me give the answer now. What was the size and the dimension? It, it's, it's, the, it's a very large territory. Well, this is because it's an odd shape. If, if we measure uh, from the, the point way over here that's kind of gone off the map all the way over to the furthest point here, it's about 60 miles approximately. So is it 50-something as you get a little north? Uh, from the furthest point up this way all the way down to the southern point here is about 85, so about 60 by 85. So that's a, a pretty good span. It's a, bit, a lot of territory here, um, the territory that's being covered. Now, verse 5b, we have the eastern border, which is the Salt Sea, all the way up to the, to the northern end. So basically, it covered from this end of the Salt Sea all the way up, and this is the, the eastern border. So we got the south and the eastern border. Let's start at verse uh, 6 now, 5b rather, through verse 11, you have the northern border. And so let's point out some key things in the northern border. Um, as he talks about the northern border, he mentions uh, uh, several places here. Starting, first of all, uh, I want you to notice uh, he mentions, um, well, he mentions Jerusalem. Um, now this is interesting because at verse 8, the border went up by the valley of the son of Hinnom. Well, that's the southern, that's on the south, uh, what is that, southwestern side of Jerusalem. The valley of the sons of Hinnom. That uh, was where idolatrous worship to Molech took place. It was in that valley. Uh, before that, it was nothing but a city incinerator where they kept a fire burning and burned all their tra uh, uh, trash and all their rubbish out in the valley of Hinnom. Then later became the seat of idolatrous worship a little bit later. We're talking about much later than this time. Um, and Jesus used that term, Gehenna, to describe the eternal place of hell. But anyway, that's the valley of the son of Hinnom. Uh, it talks about uh, uh, Jerusalem at verse 8. Uh, notice at verse 9, there's Kirjath Jerem, which you, uh, is right here. Uh, if you can see my little arrow in the middle of the circle, Kirjath Jerem. So they come by Jerusalem uh, and Kirjath Jerem. You're going to see Beth Shemesh mentioned at verse 10. Uh, Timnah mentioned at verse 10. And make the way across to Ekron. Uh, Ekron is mentioned, uh, is, is right here inside the circle. And make the way all the way over to the sea. So that's the, the northern border. Then the southern border, obviously, is the great sea on verse 12. So we've compassed the whole, uh, the whole area. Now, we mentioned this last time, and I just want to mention this briefly. What's the significance of mentioning all of these cities? In fact, we're going to get into verses 20 through verse 63, and there's a whole list of cities, many of which we don't know where they are, many of which, most of which we may not be able to pronounce properly. Uh, what value is there in that? And we made the point last time, the Bible is not written in kind of a fairy tale fashion once upon a time in a far, far away land where we can't verify. It's very specific. It's verifiable. There have been cities that we didn't know much about. And for example, Lachish is something that uh, a city that we found something about in the, what is it, the last 50 or 100 years. Uh, we didn't know something about for a long, long time or very much about for a long, long time. So there may be cities that are listed here uh, that we may find and discover something long after we're all gone. Somebody may discover. So it helps to, to verify the account 
of giving some of those specifics, and we said more about that last time. Now let's go back and talk about Caleb now. Um, let's talk about... Um, I can get to my mouth. Going the wrong direction. Let's go back to talk uh, into our outline of chapter 15. And uh, let's talk about... Uh, Caleb occupies Hebron and Debir, verses 13 and 14. He goes back and talks about those two cities. Uh, verse 13, that Caleb, um, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, he was given Hebron. Again, where is that recorded in the Pentateuch? We, we, it's not that I know of. Uh, you may have a reference that you're thinking of, but I, I, I'm not aware of one. I want you to notice at verse 14 that Joshua drove out three of the sons of Anak that were there. He went and took the land, some of the hardest sections of the land, and he went and drove out three of the giants. He's 85 years old, and he drives out three of the giants. And then he went up to Debir. Now, let's go back to our map and find Debir uh, just for a second. Uh, Debir is just below Hebron here, uh, where we see Hebron inside that Debir is right here approximately. Um, I say approximately because it wasn't on this map and I had to put it on there. Uh, but according to other maps, that's approximately where Debir is. Now, what happened with Debir? Uh, he went up and Joshua said that anyone who would attack, that he'd give his daughter. And so one of his nephews volunteered to do that, and he did. And uh, the daughter was given to him. Verses 18 and 19, the daughter made a request uh, for land that had water on it, and it was given to her. So that's why we call this section simply that Joshua, uh, Joshua, uh, wrong way, uh, inherits or occupies Hebron and Debir. That is, he, his daughter and his son-in-law uh, are occupying much of that section, but Joshua and his people, I mean Joshua, Caleb, uh, occupies that, that land as well. Now let's go to the last section here and spend just a little bit of time uh, talking about 20 to 63, and then we're going to wind up because... I'm going to have told you everything I know to say about these, um, these chapters, and if I keep on them, I'll have to make some stuff up. So, What I want to notice, though, is uh, we're going to come to uh, look at this by sections. Um, in fact, again, let, let's look at the outline first, and then we're going to talk about, we're going to map it out in just a moment. This basically is a list of the cities that were in the tribe of Judah that they occupied. Again, uh, it's kind of like reading the phone book. But he, he lists those that were in the south, those that were in the lowland, 33 to 47, 21 to 32, and then the lowland, 33 to 47, then the mountain country, that includes where Caleb was at Hebron in Debir, 40 to 80, and then in the wilderness in 61 to 60, uh, 62. So we're going to look at a little different map here and map out the, the different regions. When he talks about the south, he's talking about from about midsection to, to the south. So if you want to mark off verses 30, 21 to 32, that deals with those that are in the south. Then when he talks about the lowland, starting at verse 33 through 47, if you want to mark that off in your text, it says in the lowland, and then here's a whole list of the names. We're not going to take the time to read them all. Lakish, by the way, is mentioned there. I mentioned Lakish a moment ago. A uh, great deal of uh, archaeological study has gone on at Lakish. That's in the lowland, that is over toward the Mediterranean Sea, as the hills roll off. Then there's the mountain country, and the mountain country is found in verses 48 to verse 60. Uh, and uh, it's in this region where Hebron is mentioned, verse 54, Debir is mentioned, that's where, where Caleb, and again, I mentioned Caleb went and uh, that's where he wanted to go, is in the mountain country. Well, then we have the wilderness over here by the Salt Sea as the mountain comes down on that side. Um, and so you have in verses 60 uh, to verse 62, you have uh, in the wilderness, and here's the, all of that. Now let's close by looking at verse 63, and then we're going to look at some practical stuff and uh, catch up on our questions, and uh, uh, we'll be done here. So that's just a little, little reminder of the sections, that uh, listing the cities by, by section. All right, let's look at verse 63. As for the Jebusites, those were the occupants of Jerusalem the, uh, and, and the surrounding area, not just Jerusalem. 
uh, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Israel could not drive them out, but the Jebusites dwell among the children of, of Judah uh, as it is this day. So they didn't drive them out is, is the point to be made. Let me make a reference here to Judges. You might make a cross-reference to Judges chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 18, 19, and uh, down through about verse 21. Uh, just as a cross-reference to that, that it mentions that they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland, uh, which would include uh, that area. And But the children of Benjamin, verse 21, did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. That mentions Benjamin, but this was Judah we were talking about over there. Um, Callan Dalich makes the point, the text does not affirm that Judah alone had claim to the possession of Jerusalem exclusive of Benjamin. Um, in fact, verse 8 of our text, go back to verse 8, Jerusalem was, was a border city, which Benjamin hadn't been mentioned yet, but Benjamin's going to be mentioned later, and it's just to the north of Judah. And so uh, that's why we found one text mentioning the Benjaminites didn't drive them out, but here it says that they were not able to drive them out in, in the context of talking about uh, Judah. Now let's catch up on questions and practical stuff, and then we're done. We'll be through about uh, three or four minutes early. Uh, for the adults, let's get uh, question number um, seven. What land did uh, Judah receive? Uh, that whole su southern region we mapped out. I'm not going to give all the description of that. Uh, and who did they not drive out of the land? The Jebusites. And what kind of deal did Joshua make? Well, he said that anyone who would uh, attack Debir would get his daughter. Uh, and I think we've got all the graded ages. Let's go to some practical lessons and we will be done. What are some practical things we learn? One of the things I learn is that real faith is in the heart. Go back to verse, uh, verse 7 of our text, of chapter 14 that is. Chapter 14, uh, Caleb talks about, I was 40 years old when the servant uh, Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barney to spout the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. But what he brought back was a statement of faith. God promised us the land. We can take the land. We're well able to overcome it. So what I'm learning is that real faith in the heart. It's not just a mental acknowledgement of something. It's real, real faith in the heart. Here's the second lesson. Pessimism and negative, uh, negative attitudes melt the hearts and, and destroy the courage of others. Uh, I saw it verse 8, verse 9, verse 14. It's possible to follow the Lord. I think sometimes we leave the impression, well, it's just impossible to, uh, to, to, do, to do everything the Lord wants you to do. It's, it's just impossible to wholly follow the Lord. You can't do that. We can make a stab at it, but you can't wholly follow the Lord. Okay, he thought he did. And the Lord thought he did, too. Um, chapter 14, verses 11 and 12, we need to temper our power, and our strength with our dependence on the Lord. Joshua, uh, Caleb talks about how he was as strong now as he was when he was 40. But he tempered that with his dependence and his humility uh, and his dependence upon the Lord. And I find this one quite interesting, and that is Caleb at 85 didn't look for the easy task, but he asked for mountains to climb and, and giants to conquer and fortified cities to open up. And uh, sometimes as we get older, we look for less and less to do in the kingdom. And Joshua at 85 says, I want the mountain to climb, I want the giants to conquer, and I want fortified cities I need to take down, and I'm ready to do it. And the question is, are you ready to conquer the mountains and the giants no matter what age you may be. Stop there and continue then with our announcements here in just a few moments. <laughs>